Good day, folks, and welcome to Sunday's Thoughts from the Word. We uh, are so happy that you joined us today, and we hope that you enjoyed the sharing of God's Word. We're going to be going over to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to begin at verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse number 12. And while you're turning there in your Bible or on your device, we want to remind you that if you have a prayer request or if you want any information concerning the ministry, just go to wingsoffaithministries.ca and you can either submit your prayer request or look up any information that you want to know about the ministry. Also, if these messages are uh, being enjoyed by you or your family, we uh, pray that you would subscribe and like and share them with your friends. And we would appreciate that greatly. Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to begin there at verse number 12. What I want to share with you today is the subject of human bridges. No matter where we are in life, what age we are, what stage of life we're in. We always seem at some part of our life to be at point A. And that could be in a project we're involved with, that could be health, that could be a number of things in our life where we're starting something new or something new has come into our life. And we're at point A, we're at the beginning. And we have a destination in our mind of where we want to be. But sometimes that point B is very, very difficult to get to. And that's what we want to talk about today. The people and eventually the person who comes into our lives that gets us from point A to our destination, point B. So Hebrews, we're going to begin at verse 12 of chapter 4. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but we are all naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Then just over the page, chapter 5, beginning at verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, or his humanity, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became a source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a priest, a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And finally, we want to go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to begin at verse number 19. Therefore, my friends, 
Since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Father, this day may only the truth be spoken, and may only the truth be perceived by those who hear this message today. In Jesus' name, amen. In John chapter 5, we have a story laid out for us, and it happens during a Jewish festival. We're not told what the festival was, but we know that during all Jewish festivals that the hub of activity would be around the temple in Jerusalem. But a ways away from the temple, in the northwest corner of the city, by what was called the Sheep Gate, or a gate in which merchandise was brought into the city, there is a pool there, and it was called Bethesda, meaning House of Mercy. The pool is written about in the Dead Sea Scrolls in which we found. Also, archaeologists have uncovered this pool that had five covered colonnades. Actually, it was twin pools about the size of an American football field. And around this pool lay different people who had different ailments. And there was a belief of the Jews that at certain times, for whatever reason, the water was stirred in this pool. And if those who had an ailment could be the first to get there, they would be cured of whatever ailment they had, or at least that was the belief. Now there's a man at this pool who's at point A in his life. He is paralyzed, unable to move his legs, and he is at point A in his life. Point B for him, or his destination, his ultimate destination, was to be the first one to get to the water when it was stirred. But this man was at point A for over 38 years. He had never moved from that point. Point B was he could see it, but he could never get there. Always someone else, when that water was stirred, got to the pool and point B before he could. And then one day, someone, not going to the festival, not at the temple area, but here in the northwest corner of Jerusalem, comes a man. And this man inquires about this paralyzed man and finds out that he's been at point A in his life for 38 years, never able to get from point A to point B to that water. And that man, of course, is Jesus. And Jesus inquires about this paralyzed man. 
who is at point A in his life. And as he comes up to the man after learning about him, he says to him the obvious question, do you want to get well? And of course the man wants to get well, but he replies to Jesus, I have no one to get me from point A to point B. I have no one to help me to get to the water, and every time I want to get from point A to point B in my life, someone else gets there ahead of me, because I have no one. I don't have that human bridge, and I'm unable to do it myself. I don't have the capability. But Jesus goes one step further. He doesn't take the man who in his mind has to get from where he is to the water. No, he simply goes beyond that and says, rise, take up your mat, which you've been lying on, and walk. And John tells us that strength came into his legs. And instead of having to go down to what he thought would be point B, his destination in life, the water, he is taken to point B in his life right where he is by Jesus Christ. Christ provided for him the human bridge to get him from point A in his life to his destination. Point B. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, we read of another man who, very different from the man at the pool of Bethesda, this man is very wealthy. He comes from a kingdom called Moron, a kingdom that was very wealthy, a kingdom that at one point in history Rome tried to conquer and could not. It is today the modern Sudan or Ethiopia, kind of borders on both countries. But it was a kingdom that existed in the time of the New Testament and the minister of finance or the, the man who ran the treasury for that kingdom is a man who is intrigued by Judaism. And in Acts chapter 8 we are told that he comes to Jerusalem to come to a festival. Now, someone doesn't travel all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem unless he is intrigued or wants to become part of the Jewish faith. So obviously, he had total belief in the idea of one God and that God being Yahweh. And he has been to the festival we know he was a person of means because as the story unfolds, we realize that he has in possession Jewish scrolls, which not even Jews could get. But he has them. He's been able to get them and purchase them. And the festival is over and he's on his way home, taking the road, from Jerusalem and heading south, a 50-mile journey from Jerusalem to Gaza, and then from there he'll go into the desert to return home. But he's at point A in his life. He wants to be an adherent to Judaism. 
But for two reasons, he can't get to point B. Number one, he's a Gentile. And number two, he's an Enoch. And both factors prohibit him from becoming a proselyte, a converted Jew. So he's on his way home from this festival, journeying from Jerusalem to Gaza, and miles away from him is another man. He's in the area of Samaria. And he is contacted by an angel who summons him to head to Gaza, to the same road that this Ethiopian Enoch is traveling on. And so Philip heads to this road, going from Jerusalem to Gaza. And as he gets to the road, he sees this chariot. And the same angel or another angel tells him to run up beside the chariot, to get alongside of it. And in the chariot, this Ethiopian Enoch, who has got these Jewish scrolls, is reading a passage from Isaiah chapter 53. And that passage happens to be the passage about the suffering of the Jewish Messiah. And he's reading the passage, trying to make some sense of it. He's at point A. He wants desperately to get to point B. He wants to belong to what he believes is true. But he's not quite understanding what he's reading or what's meant by it. And Philip comes up beside the chariot and hears him reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And they don't know each other, they've never met. But all of a sudden, Philip says to him, do you understand what you're reading? And the very fact that this Ethiopian Enoch, this minister of finance, just says to him, hop up here, help me. Help me understand this. Tells us how desperately he wanted to get from point A to point B in his life. So Philip hops up into the chariot, and as they're going down this desert road, heading toward the Enoch's home, Philip begins to explain to him how Isaiah 53 is connected to Jesus Christ. He opens up the understanding of that Ethiopian Enoch. And by Philip's conversation with him, he is immediately taken by that human bridge from point A to point B. And no, he doesn't have to become a Jew. He can go over those hurdles of being a Gentile, and being an Enoch, he can belong. And as they're riding in that chariot down the road, and the Enoch comes to understand the story of Jesus Christ and what Christ has done for him, he believes. And as they pass by a pool of water, he says to Philip, I believe. What's to stop me from being baptized? There's nothing stopping me now from getting to point B, from belonging, not to the Jewish community,
but to the Messiah. And he and Philip head down to the water, and there he's baptized. And Acts chapter 8 says that Philip immediately vanished, was taken away. But it said the Ethiopian got back in his chariot and went home rejoicing. Why? Because he had been taken to point B in his life. He had reached his destination. A human bridge. In Acts chapter 10, we have our third example. This man lives in Caesarea. He too is a Gentile. But he too, like the Ethiopian Enoch, is fascinated by the idea of one God. And the scriptures tell us in Acts that he not only just believed, but he actually had deeds to go along with his belief, as far as his belief took him. He was at point A. He had a belief, he prayed, he did a lot of good works, but he knew, something inside of him knew he was not at point B in his life. He is a Roman centurion named Cornelius, in charge of about 600 people in the fortress city of Caesarea. And one day at three in the afternoon, out of nowhere, an angel appears to him and says to him, Cornelius, you're at point A, but God sees you at point A. Your gifts, your prayers, where you're at in life, what you believe has come before God. But I want you to notice that it's not an angel that tells Cornelius how to be saved. Cornel Cornelius, he's at point A, but this angel is not going to get him to point B. He tells him, you're at point A, God sees you, God hears you. But in order to get to point B, you're going to need a human bridge. And the angel tells him that this human bridge is in Joppa. And he is to send people to find this man who can take Cornelius from point A to point B. Miles away, Peter is up on a roof. He's waiting for his meal. The scriptures tell us that he sort of went into a trance or a daze. And a vision is given to him. And that vision tells him basically not to walk away from anyone. The vision was a vision of creatures, four-footed creatures, that a Jewish person certainly would not go near or eat. But God tells Peter three times, never call unclean what I call clean. Open up your heart to what was forbidden in times past. And the representatives of Cornelius the Centurion arrive in Joppa. They find the home that Peter is staying at, Simon the Tanner. And Peter, putting two and two together with the help of the Holy Spirit, 
goes down and welcomes these Gentiles into his home. And they summon him to come to Caesarea, that their boss, Cornelius, wants Peter to be his human bridge. And the next day, Peter and a, a few people with him take that journey to Caesarea to do something they've never done before in their lives, to enter the home of a Gentile. And the scriptures say that Peter came to his home. Cornelius had gathered together friends and relatives. All people that he wanted along with himself to hear this message that he knew Peter would proclaim to them. And that day, people who did not have the capability of getting from point A to point B because they were Gentiles, heard the message from Peter, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, what he had done from Galilee to Judea to Jerusalem. And as they heard that message from Peter, as Peter became their human bridge, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came down and everyone in that home, every Gentile, was filled with the Holy Spirit. They were baptized and they reached point B in their lives. Human bridges, Jesus, Philip, Peter. But I go back to the text which I read to you at the beginning of this message. No matter where we are in life or who we are, when it comes to our relationship with God, we are all at point A. And like the paralyzed man, the Ethiopian Enoch, and the Roman centurion, we do not have the capability to reach point B when it comes to our relationship with God. We are all incapable of getting the point B. And it doesn't matter how hard we try, where we go to church, who we hang around with, what good deeds we've done, none of that provides us the capability to get from point A to point B and to reach our destination with God. Only one person can do that. In Hebrews, I read to you that Jesus Christ took on humanity. It had to be that way. There had to be a human bridge. Just like the examples that I shared with you today, there had to be a human bridge because we did not have the capability of having a relationship with God. That was all destroyed at the beginning of humanity. But Jesus Christ took on humanity. And as the scriptures that I read to you was tested in every way, just as we are, with every emotion, with every temptation, with every stress, just as we are, yet without sin. And then was crucified, taking our sin. He who had not sinned became sin for us. Why? Because we needed a human bridge. We were incapable. 
We needed that bridge to get us from point A to point B. And that's what Jesus Christ became for us. That person at the right time who could take us from where we were to what we could be. And not only does Jesus Christ provide us the way, the access, that bridge to have relationship with God, the Father. But after having that relationship, Jesus continues to be our human bridge, our high priest, to affect the outcomes of our lives, to constantly get us from point A to point B, no matter what we're facing in life, be it finances, be it health, be it relationships, Christ is always that human bridge who has been there and done that and provides the way for us to constantly get from point A to point B in our life. And without Christ, without that human bridge, will always be stuck at point A. And so I speak to two groups of people this day. One group, you may be at point A and never saw Jesus as that human bridge to your destination. And to you today, I would say that this message for you is God saying to you, I have provided that human bridge for you to have access to. For another group of people who may know Christ as their Savior, what I'm saying to you this day might be the message for you at some part of your life where you are stuck at point A to get to point B in your life, to realize that only in Christ can you find that point B in your life. I close today because I'm sure all of us can find relevance in our lives through these three people whether it was a physical barrier, whether it was a can't belong barrier, I can't achieve it barrier, Jesus Christ can cross that barrier. He, today, is our human bridge from point A to point B. And if you don't know Christ this day, in my closing prayer, I would certainly, it would be my plea, it would be my advice that you accept him as your savior, as your human bridge, to bring your life to its rightful destination, to find point B. Let's close in prayer. Father, in the holy name of Jesus, we ask for your grace and mercy upon those who will hear this message this morning. Father, we pray that many would see their lives at point A, destinations they have not yet reached. And we want them to realize and we ask by the Holy Spirit that they would realize that it is only through you through Jesus Christ that they can find that way to point B that you are the man the God who became human to provide that bridge access to God and access to outcomes that we strive for in our lives Father, we pray for all those who would call upon you, even in this moment, that you would receive them, that you would give them a witness in their spirit, Lord, that you are with them, 
And we ask these things through the precious name of Jesus. Amen. It's been good to be with you. Have a good day, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you.